This isn't a rescue effort anymore. It's clearly an issue of pulling bodies out from the buildings. By the mid-2000s, the skyline of Beijing was changing. With the 2008 Olympic Games approaching, the government was devoting massive resources to make the capital into an international showcase. When China made its first unsuccessful Olympic bid to host the 2000 Games, the official slogan was, A more open Beijing awaits the Olympics. At the end of 2006, with the Games less than two years away, the government announced a dramatic liberalization in the rules governing foreign journalists. The rules were changed before the Olympics uh, in order to satisfy the International Olympic Committee about press freedom in China. Um, and they, they specifically said, and this was of course the first time that foreign correspondents were allowed to go out of Beijing or Shanghai into the countryside without asking permission first. Um, and you were technically allowed to speak to anybody who's willing to speak to you. There was a pretty sincere uh, commitment by um, the media authorities in China and the foreign ministry to fulfill uh, their obligations in hosting the Olympics uh, to allow much more unfettered coverage of national events by the foreign press corps you know, than had been the case. From a reporting point of view, we were told that uh, the Olympics was going to be the turning event for us that we would have freedom then, complete freedom to travel around the country. Uh, China was opening and it would open to us as foreign reporters. We could go anywhere. I mean, it was actually hard for us to realize, gee, we could just go get on a plane and fly to Xinjiang or something like that without a fixer and arrange a car and have a hotel and that kind of thing. So it gave us extraordinarily more freedom to go and do the kinds of stories that we wanted to do which I think were both as two parts. One, talking about China as an economy, as a growing economy, what that's going to mean to the United States, but also taking people into the heart of China, which we had not really been able to do. Whatever the new rules, however, away from Beijing, the correspondents more often than not found it was the same old story. We all wanted to test the rules to see whether there would really be a change. And so we all kind of trotted out to the countryside, bearing our copies of the regulations printed out to discover that although the regulations were there on paper, on the ground, there was still this sort of extreme reluctance by local officials to allow you to interview people mm. and to talk to people on, on really any subject whatsoever. The problem was the local authorities who did not want anyone in Beijing to know that something embarrassing was happening on their patch. Uh, it wasn't that those authorities are worried about what people are going to read in Boston or Berlin or Timbuktu. They were worried that via Berlin, Boston or Timbuktu, Beijing would find out about it. In 2007, Melissa Chan, a Hong Kong-born Chinese-American who'd studied at Yale, became the Beijing correspondent for the English language network of the Qatar-based Al Jazeera. As an Asian-American, as a Chinese-American, I went in wanting to be very fair for China and feeling that it was being unfairly covered to a certain extent by Western media and working for this channel that really wanted to turn things on its head, Al Jazeera English, with this mandate to question and do stories no one else did. One of her first stories was a feature about a child living on a farm while her parents worked in the city. We spent the morning with this little girl and she cooked her breakfast, went to school and then came back from school and it was very rural, it was pastoral, there were little, you know, chickens running around and a Chinese village and a Chinese little home. So I thought it was just a nice color piece. But the local authorities were absolutely terrified and I think they found out once uh, we filmed the little girl going to school. So suddenly we were... Um, surrounded and they even locked the courtyard uh, where we were and refused to let us out and started asking us a lot of questions. Um, but you know eventually things got sorted out and we were let go. Uh, but I do remember that it was a Saturday morning at around 8 a.m. when the Chinese Foreign Ministry knew that I would definitely still be in bed 
and I was back in Beijing and I get a call because they'd heard about this incident down in Anhui. I guess the local authorities reported it back to Beijing. The foreign ministry said, if Al Jazeera is going to start acting like the BBC and CNN, then we're going to start treating Al Jazeera like the BBC and CNN. And then they slammed the phone down. Ian Johnson of the Wall Street Journal, who'd left China in 2001 and written a book about the Falun Gong, was now trying to get back to Beijing, only to discover the Chinese wouldn't give him a visa. They called in the uh, bureau chief and also the uh, foreign editor who at the time was living in, in, in Asia and basically to bang their shoe on the table and said this guy is never coming back into China he has violated uh, all kinds of rules and regulations and they began it was very transparent they were trying to drive a wedge between me and the paper and they were saying his reporting was no trouble at all it was just his book that was the problem and we didn't like his book um, and they said what part of the book we didn't like his Falun Gong part of the book but that was the only part of the book that was based entirely on what I'd done for the journal. Um, so it was a bit disingenuous um, to say that. And they were adamant that I could not get back in. Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation had just acquired the Wall Street Journal. Johnson enlisted the help of former CNN International Desk editor Mei Yen. Her father had been a high-ranking communist official, and she now handled News Corporation's government relations office in China. She said, do you know Murdoch's coming tomorrow? And I said, I, I didn't know that at all. Nobody told me that from the journal. And she said, well, we need to get something in his hands and get him involved. This is our opportunity. So she said, send me a one paragraph synopsis of your case. And, um, and so she made a special trip into the office, printed it out, went with Murdoch, who was going to go see the state council information office. Uh, minister, which is it's a minister level position in China, um, and they're responsible for China's kind of image outside. And, um, and she, you know, put it in front of his nose, and he didn't know me from Adam, obviously. Um, and he's like, oh, oh uh, a bit of a complicated situation, but if you say so, May, why not? You know, so she, he went in and by all accounts gave a great little thing, you know, a great little talk and said, you know, I got this little favor and this fella, you know, wrote some articles and who knows if they were right or wrong. It was all, but it was all 10 years ago, you know, forget about this and give him another chance for my sake. And then the minister said, I'll see what I can do. Soon after, the Chinese promised Johnson a visa for the Olympics. He got a full accreditation in 2009. The approach of the games, and the hope it would bring greater liberalization, also inspired China's dissidents. Among them was the prominent intellectual, Liu Xiaobo. Evan Osnos had taken over as the New Yorker's correspondent following the departure of Peter Hessler. I met Liu Xiaobo in uh, 2007, when he was at that point a literary critic and, and a well-known dissident. He'd been writing criticisms of the state for a number of years. And I went to go see him to talk about what the Olympics was going to mean for China. And Liu Xiaobo was, was optimistic, actually. He felt that this moment in the spotlight in which China was sort of pulled into the international system in a new way, that this would put pressure on the leadership to honor some of the constitutional commitments that it had made or commitments to the international uh, to international organizations, and and he was he showed me a um, a letter that he was writing that was going to be distributed and signed by a bunch of other dissidents. To host the Olympics, the authorities embarked on an extraordinary construction boom, both to create venues for the games, like the much heralded Bird's Nest Stadium, but also to rid Beijing of many of its historic hutongs, neighborhoods with narrow alleys lined with quaint but often dilapidated courtyard homes. The way the Chinese handled the run-up to the Beijing Olympics is uh, one of what you could sarcastically say is why dictatorships work. If they needed to cut a swath of five blocks to do something, there were no meetings, no lawsuits, no input, no nothing. They just went in and told people, okay, you're out of here. Um, to their credit, they didn't throw people onto the streets. They were really, I mean, this was part of a longer effort by China to rebuild Beijing, to tear down the old hutongs. Uh, 
You couldn't live in Beijing and not see what was being knocked down, uh, or, or indeed hear from the people who were living in the places that were being knocked down, because there was a great deal of, uh, of activity amongst petitioners, amongst people who were losing their homes, um, getting in touch with foreign journalists to tell us their stories. And they were, they were very moving stories, and often you know, cases of, of apparent tremendous injustice in terms of how much compensation they were or were not receiving. So there was, there was a great deal of, of the, the, the negative aspects of Beijing's development um, to report on. I mean, which of course the Chinese government objected to enormously because there was also a lot of positive uh, to what was going on. But it's just less, frankly, interesting, exciting to write about a new subway line that's opened, which actually will do a great deal of good for many hundreds of thousands of people who live on its route. Um, when you've got the dust and rubble of somebody's life uh, and, and their tears behind it. The stories that we did about, uh, about urban expansion, moving people, forcefully moving people from their homes, people who trying to cling to their homes while they were being torn down around them. Uh, in a couple of instances there, people that we'd interviewed had, been, had literally disappeared. Some of them had, had been taken away and uh, been locked down, held under house arrest, uh, beaten up. Uh, we'd been detained on several occasions and, and, uh, and slapped around, frankly, on a couple of occasions. And the Chinese took people out of these areas and put them into high-rises. I mean, they did give them a better standard of life. Funnily enough, the complaints that we heard most from people at that time was not about being moved out of the hutongs. It was about losing their neighborhoods because they'd lived there for decades and in some cases even generations. And when you take people like that and put them in a high rise, you lose all sense of neighborhood. And you know, it was, they, they got a better standard of life. They got an apartment, they had running water, they had heat, they had toilets, they had all the kind of stuff, but they felt like they had lost some part of themselves when that happened. There is no more of the Beijing that I recognize as, as a child. Only Tiananmen Square is still there. For the authorities though, and indeed for many Chinese, the transformation was essential as China prepared for its grand entry onto the international stage. The, the government had hyped the Olympics and there was a lot of genuine uh, uh, public uh, emotion that the Olympics was going to be this this uh, high for China. It was going to be a game-changing event uh, for international perceptions of, uh, of China. In March of 2008, riots broke out in the Tibetan capital Lhasa. Ethnic Tibetans went on a rampage, attacking Han Chinese who had settled in Tibet. The Chinese did not allow American or other foreign journalists to witness the unrest. The only reporter in Lhasa when the trouble erupted was James Miles of The Economist, who was on a brief, previously approved visit and who soon left. But the prevailing Western narrative, widely reflected in the press coverage, of Tibetans resisting oppressive Chinese rule ran directly counter to the Chinese narrative. It blamed the violence on Tibet's exiled spiritual leader the Dalai Lama and advocates of Tibetan independence supported by an allegedly biased Western press. Soon, the Western media came under fierce attack, both from the Chinese government and from the Chinese public, especially on the Internet. CNN became a particular target. Tomas Etzler worked for Czech TV and freelanced for CNN. Somebody, probably in Atlanta, took a, took a photograph, which was a white photograph of Chinese military trucks on the left side of the picture and on the right side of the picture were Tibetans throwing stones at them. Somebody cropped the Tibetans out and put this photograph on, on the CNN website and it created another huge wave of, of, of anti-CNN feelings. And it was at this point when I think the anti-CNN.com uh, website was launched. The website got millions of supporters. There were a lot of threats. Uh, the Bureau was receiving daily hundreds of faxes and, and emails, you know, of, of, of threats, of death threats. Basically, we couldn't really operate. Um, we couldn't really go cover anything. CNN Bureau had to evacuate, had to, <laughs> because there were so many, so many threats. They evacuated to a nearby hotel and they moved back, but even after they moved back, there was a 
police, there was a physical police present protection in front of the bureau. And the CNN bureau and staff were hardly the only target. What I, I became really worried about was uh, because a lot of the threats became things like, well, we're going to run you over, or we're watching you, we know where you live. I became worried about collateral damage, especially uh, of my family or my, uh, my colleagues. That's the first time I've gotten hate mail in, in China, email, and really some of it threatening, like, we're going to kill you and your wife. But I got a lot of death threats, and I wasn't doing anything. Um, so I think, you know, it's, but it's not just CNN, it's the foreign media. And someone put the um, address of our office on the internet and all our assistants were, you know, harassed and told they were traitors. And there was this real atmosphere of absolute fear for a while. Looking back now, this was the beginning of a, a very nationalistic, you know, a move towards a much more nationalistic China. And I think those were the themes that we then saw in the Olympic opening ceremony and the themes that President Xi Jinping uh, has, has continued to, to develop. After the unrest was suppressed, the government took a small group of invited reporters to Lhasa to show that everything was fine. But the trip backfired on the, on the government because they, when we were taken to the Jokong Temple, uh, you know, this holy shrine of Tibetan Buddhism, a group of about, of about 20 to 30 young monks came out and they pushed past us. <laughs> they first started saying how you know, we were being led on this sham trip and that the shrine had been closed ever since the riot. Because I was with the AP and I was there with a, a, uh, a colleague from TV and a photographer, the story was just instantly everywhere. And the government was really unhappy. Then we started to get death threats from angry, uh, patriotic Chinese. Following the Lhasa riots, anti-Chinese protests dogged the progress of the Olympic flame as it made its way through Europe and the U.S., further inflaming Chinese public opinion. In Beijing, the government decided the flame should be carried to the summit of the Chinese side of Mount Everest. A small group of foreign reporters were invited to cover the event. Producer Tomas Etzler went for CNN. When I arrived to Everest when they find out that I'm representing CNN, I had like, we arrived and of course all the Chinese media were there filming our arrival and the moment we arrived, the moment they figured out I'm from CNN, I had like really 200 journalists around me, all the microphones on the cameras, asking if CNN should apologize. The Chinese had originally promised that the foreign reporters would be allowed to stay at the Everest base camp. Then came the Tibetan riots. They were really paranoid. They were really afraid that some activists might make it up there with some free Tibet uh, banners or other slogans and that would be broadcasted live. They, this, this, they were petrified. Of the reporters were confined to a small settlement several kilometers away. And they didn't want us in the base camp, so we went approximately, we were like maybe two kilometers outside of the base camp in some small facility. They built up some sort of wooden shacks for us there. And I remember one of the, uh, it was a Kyoto guy. He was also some from the Kyoto Japanese agency. He was a climber. He says, you know, I am going to the base camp. They promised us this. I will, I'm a climber. I can go around. So he left. And one hour later, he was brought back at the gunpoint. He was escorted by two soldiers with Kalashnikovs. What's going on? The whole building is shaking. The whole building is shaking. On May 12, 2008, a massive earthquake hit Sichuan province. Nearly 70,000 people died. NPR anchor Melissa Block and some colleagues happened to be in the provincial capital Chengdu for a long-planned series. So Melissa Block was con conducting an interview. I think it was with a priest. She was inside a church when it happened. And um, she kept the tape rolling and she described how the cross on the top of the church was waving. Oh my goodness, we're in the middle of an earthquake? Earthquake, The whole yeah. block is shaking. Yeah. Pieces, the, ch the, the top of the church is falling down. 
Um, so NPR had quite a sizable contingent that was already in Chengdu at the time of the earthquake. So they were the first people on, on the scene, you know, at some of the school collapses, and they did some really, you know, there was some very strong reporting. Edward Wong, whose parents had immigrated to the U.S. and whose father had once served in the People's Liberation Army, had just arrived in Beijing for the New York Times after several years covering the war in Iraq. The Sichuan uh, earthquake was the first story I covered while I was in China. Um, we felt the tremors in Beijing that day, um, and I got on a plane hours later to fly into Chongqing. Um, they had already shut down the airport in Chengdu, so we landed in Chongqing um, and scrambled to get a car to drive um, hours west out to the earthquake zone in Sichuan. Of all the stories I've covered in China in the last seven years, the Sichuan quake was the closest story in terms of a parallel to Iraq. Like when I got into the town Dujiangyan, which was one of the hardest hit towns in the earthquake zone, I saw buildings that had been turned into rubble and I saw bodies protruding from the rubble or protruding from buildings. There were people, their torsos were sticking out of building walls, their arms were dangling. I saw bodies that were turning colorless. It was a tough scene to take in. Like Wong, Al Jazeera's Melissa Chan was among the first Beijing-based reporters to reach the scene. We've arrived in the center of the town, and there's absolute silence. This isn't a rescue effort anymore. It's clearly an issue of pulling bodies out from the buildings. The earthquake took place at around local time 2 p.m. in Sichuan, and we got there about 2 a.m. that night, so about 12, 11 hours after the earthquake. We hiked and tried to get into Beichuan, and I think we were the first group there, and local officials tried to stop us, and that was actually captured on tape. They wouldn't let us go, and we argued for hours, and finally, finally, um, was allowed to go. With communications in the worst hit areas down, Ed Wong and other reporters had to travel to Chengdu to file. And in Chengdu, uh, we were still experiencing tremors. There were, in hotel rooms where we stayed there, uh, the buildings would shake and then people would have to immediately evacuate the buildings. And this would happen several times each day. As the scale of the disaster became apparent, um, vast numbers of Chinese journalists uh, and bloggers traveled to Sichuan and the government didn't stop them. Um, why not? Who knows? I think maybe just that they weren't prepared for it. They'd never had such a situation before. Uh, and they let people arrive, turn up in Sichuan uh, with cameras and cell phones, and they didn't stop them. Um, the, the same applied actually to the foreign press, were allowed a great deal of, of freedom reporting that earthquake. I went to a hospital, a day or two later, I went to a hospital and interviewed some survivors, a family that had survived um, the, um, the earthquake, and they had been trapped in rubble. I interviewed a husband and a wife, and their, their young daughter was also there in the room. And the husband and wife had been trapped in a house when it had collapsed. And when I walked into the hospital room, I looked at the wife lying there in the bed. The husband was sitting next to her and looked at the wife, and I saw that her legs had, been, had just been amputated. Uh, she had both legs cut off. And they sat there and told me the story of how um, they had been buried alive in their house and that they had um, thought that they would die at that moment. They were sort of giving up on life and they told each other that they would survive for their daughter and they held on to each other and stuck it through and the rescuers eventually got to them, but um, not in time to save the woman's legs which had been trapped under rubble. So I think that story um, was one that still stays with me and that haunts me today. Early on, at the very beginning, the rescue and relief operation was so intense and the Chinese really, they had an interest in getting the rest of the world to see what they were up against. And so I think that they had an interest in allowing open reporting. In a way it was the most exciting time that I was in China as a journalist. It was the only time where I felt that I was working alongside Chinese colleagues and we were working together. The uh, Chinese journalists can do one heck of a job if they weren't, you know, shackled, right? And during the earthquake, they were able to do some amazing work. They were free to cover the story. And I have to say, in I was there um, as a reporter, but I was also a, um, a consumer of the news that they were producing, mm -hmm. especially off TV. You know, they were 
I remember they were covering literally the death of this young man who's, who was buried under a building. Only his head was halfway out. And this reporter was talking to this man as he was dying, you know, feeding him a sip of Coke. You know, and as he was talking about his hopes and dreams of what he would do when he gets out. And of course, we watched this throughout the day on Chinese national television. And I was crying, the whole country was crying. It was incredible what the Chinese journalists are able to do once they were free. There was this tiny window where it seemed as if suddenly uh, the, the local officials were so helpful to the foreign media and everybody was so nice and suddenly there was this little window as to what reporting might have been like mm -hmm. um, without all that harassment. And it produced an abrupt change in Chinese public opinion about foreign reporters. We got all this wonderful mail about our coverage. I mean, it was almost like this it saved the foreign journalist coverage. People decided actually the foreigners weren't so bad in covering China because it was a very sympathetic portrait of, you know, what, how strong the people were in Sichuan. But then the story began to change. Well, suddenly there were a lot of questions about all these elementary and middle schools in Sichuan and why all these students particularly seem to have died from the quake and the comparison of the government buildings that stood and didn't crumble and the schools that crumbled immediately and there were a lot of questions, I think, first from local journalists and then foreign reporters started picking up on it and covering it and suddenly the attitude in Sichuan changed and no one was allowed to cover anything and the same old stuff happened again, being followed wherever you went, being tailed, you really couldn't do any stories, you tried to talk to parents and some of them would defy authorities, they were and angry, and they had lost children uh, or in the ca most cases, parents had lost a child, their only child. And so they wanted to talk to journalists, whether they were foreign or local. But it suddenly became a lot harder. Authorities just would, you know, follow us in cars, stop people, and essentially prevent any investigative journalism into what actually happened at these schools. Very touchy subject, basically. The earthquake happened, and it really just really hits you over the head, you know, about the people who are left out of this miracle, economic miracle, right? The schools that collapsed, the, uh, the families that lost their only child. You know, I, I think for me that was when um, China became um, more than just a story. It was no longer just a story. It was too personal for me. You know, I think that um, to see so many dead children who looked just like my own, um, it was very hard to be just a reporter at that point. As the Olympics approached, the international outpouring of sympathy, coupled with China's dramatic economic progress, shifted the focus and tone of much American press coverage. NBC News anchor Tom Brokaw first visited China in the 1970s. He'd returned in the 80s, including immediately after the Tiananmen Square crackdown. He was astonished at what he saw now. I can't help but wonder what Mao would think if he were alive today to see this scene. On the other hand, if he were alive today, it's unlikely that China would be hosting the Olympic Games, a modern and prosperous industrial state even though it still has a lot of the mild hangover in terms of political control. What I wanted to do in the hotel where I was staying was take the NBC guests and my NBC colleagues and grab them by the arm and say, you're not going to believe what this was like just 20 years ago. <laughs> you cannot believe this, that they've done this in this short amount of time is historic beyond my ability to describe it. They wanted the Beijing Olympics to be the spectacular spectacular moment of China coming out to the world. Now, that's not unusual. Lots of people use the Olympics to show off their country. But I think to the Chinese, it wasn't just showing off to the, to the rest of the world. The Chinese, to the Chinese, this was legitimacy. They're one of the big guys now. They can put this event on. They spent, I don't even know, no one knows, how many millions or billions they spent on these venues. Didn't care. Didn't care if they ever used them again. Hundreds of foreign reporters were granted visas for the Olympics. 
But at the same time, they, there was a huge clampdown on protests, on dissenters. They uh, shipped people out of Beijing. They wanted to make sure that uh, there were no troublemakers around, that the press wouldn't see anything um, that the Chinese officials didn't want them to see. So um, on the surface, there was this uh, looser atmosphere, but really behind the scenes, uh, things ha were getting tighter and they were making it hard for journalists to report on the real social issues that were going on in parts of China. Just a week before the Olympics were due to open, the government's impulse to control the foreign press was vividly on display. The German network ZDF had gotten special permission to do a live broadcast from the Great Wall. Despite the official approval, police moved in and stopped it unaware that the entire incident was being broadcast live on German TV. But such episodes were overshadowed by the spectacle the Chinese were laying on for the games. The point was to show the world that they were a 21st century country and that they were big and they were good and they were bright and the architecture glistened and the skies were clear and they did it. Indeed, how the Chinese cleared the skies became a major Olympic story. Barbara Demick had recently taken over the Los Angeles Times Bureau. We ended up writing a lot about um, air quality, and I think that was you know, the, really the beginning of the surge of stories about um, Beijing's air quality problems. Um, I write, wrote a lot about the Weather Modification Bureau. I loved weather modification. I thought it was a very interesting story. They installed a very, very sophisticated system going out, I think, like a couple of hundred miles to deal with the, uh, the issue that they were most afraid of, which was air pollution. And the days of the Olympics, I must tell you, were some of the most spectacular clean air days that I spent in Beijing, a city which is almost as famous for its pollution as it is for anything else. You know, they monitored factories. They had a kind of a, as you would expect, high-tech system. They shut down places like, I think like 100 miles away, if they thought that the air currents were going to bring bad air or pollution into Beijing. It all worked. There was this sort of huge upswell of patriotism. And I remember I, I watched the opening ceremony with a family who'd been evicted from their house to make way for the Olympic Stadium. And they were so proud, they were so happy, and they didn't, you know, they really didn't seem to mind that their entire lives had been uprooted to make way for this, you know, extraordinary uh, sort of display of national pride and national strength. And, um, you know, that was when I began to tell that the mood had changed and, uh, and it really had changed in a way that there was no turning back on. People were very proud. The Chinese were very proud that night of the opening of the Olympics. Um, I think that it was being watched all over China. Um, people I encountered thought that it was a symbol of China sort of rightfully taking its place as one of the preeminent nations of the world. But Qing Qing Ni, who'd been born and raised in Beijing, watched the spectacle with decidedly mixed emotions. When you were growing up as a in communist China, as a communist Chinese, you know, you believe everything you're told, but as an American journalist, you're trained to look beneath the surface, and you f you're face to face with the real people of China, and their stories are so far away from Beijing. You know, the people that I talked to that year all across China, uh, you know, they're, they're suffering in ways where, you know, the Olympics had nothing to do with their lives. So it was really hard to feel too much. Although it was really impressive to see, <laughs> you know, it was a big show. And despite Beijing's desire to put its best face forward, the Chinese system ended up pushing some reporters who wanted to write positive stories into doing negative ones. We were trying to get an interview, any interview with anybody who could tell us about the table tennis team. And, you know, we were trying and trying and writing letters and we needed, you know, sort of a feature story. And we ended up going to um, write a story about petitioners instead, um, protesters, because we were able to get to them. Four months after the Olympics ended, Liu Xiaobo and 300 other intellectuals and dissidents signed a document called Charter 08. It was a sweeping call for political reform, inspired in part by the government's promises of a more open China because of the Olympics. Because he had become the 
one of the authors of Charter 08, which was a manifesto that called for uh, fundamental political change in China. And before it was released, before Charter 08 was actually finally made public to the, was finally made public, the police showed up at his front door and he was detained and was eventually put on trial and sentenced to 11 and a half years. Melissa Chan went to Leo's apartment block hoping to interview his wife. She brought the foreign ministry's booklet of more liberal rules about the press issued in the run-up to the Olympics. I went there and this guy who refused to identify himself, and this is right here in Beijing, right? He refused to identify himself and I said, I, I want to interview somebody in this apartment complex and here is this booklet in English and Chinese of the Chinese law saying that foreign reporters can interview whoever we wish so long as they agree. And I said, look, look, turn, and I turned the pages. I said, Wen Jiabao signed off on this law. And this unidentified man in Beijing, probably 20 minutes from Tiananmen Square, looks at me, he says, I don't care if Wen Jiabao signed this law or not. It really says something about the rule of law in China, but also about that specific uh, set of rules for foreign correspondence, governing foreign correspondence, and how it really didn't work. Chan didn't get the interview. In 2010, Liu Xiaobo was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He is still in prison.